more people to log on. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, welcome everybody to the Engaging Families webinar series. Uh, we're very excited uh, to be partnering with the Behavioral Health Care Resource Program over at UNC um, to provide you with this series of webinars specific to engaging families, um, in particular caregivers within child and family um, services. So this is part two in our series. We'll go over sort of what the layout of the series is in, in just a minute. I did want to take a, a minute to, for us to introduce ourselves. My name is Lydia Franco. I am a social worker, trainer, and director of clinical initiatives at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at the NYU Silver School of Social Work. And with me today, I have Cara Dina Sale. Hi, everyone. My name is Cara Dina Sale, and I'm a social worker. I work with Lydia and Jerry on a variety of, of projects and engagement is something that we work on quite a bit throughout a variety of organizations. So really happy to be here with you today. And we also have Jerry Burton. Hi, this is Geraldine Jerry Burton and I'm a parent partner here at the um, Silver Institute for po Poverty Policy and Research. Sorry about that. And what I do is bring the family perspective to the table and I work with Carol and Lydia and welcome everyone. We're very excited about um, interacting with you and doing this webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. And I think, uh, you know, we just want to share a little bit about the work that we do around engagement. So we work with Dr. Mary McKay and other colleagues here at McSilver Institute that have been uh, longtime researchers around this process of engagement. Um, and so I think what we can bring to you is some of our experience both in our research studies as well as in our direct supervision and training experience as we worked with um, a number of different agencies and providers in different settings, really kind of thinking through how best to engage the family within services, whether we're talking about mental health services or other types of services that are family specific. So this is part one of um, uh, two webinars within our series that really focuses on some of those strategies uh, around engaging um, uh, families and services. Um, so I did want to orient folks to the webinar if it is the first time that you're on. Um, so everybody is currently muted and you'll stay muted during the whole webinar since we have quite a few folks who, who have uh, registered and are logging on. If you'd like to communicate with us, please use that chat box on the right-hand side. If you don't see a chat box, there is a, a bubble right at the top that, that says chat. If you hit that, the chat box will pop up in that panel on the bottom right. When you would like to send us some comments, some feedback, there will be some times that we'll ask you some questions. Um, please just uh, write in that chat box. Make sure you send to all panelists in the dropdown and then hit um, send so that we can see your comments and feedback. Um, we will be happy to answer questions as they arise, or we may hold some of those questions uh, for the end. And also so that you know the webinar is being recorded, slides, um, uh, any handouts that we show will be posted on a web page that we have created for this series that you'll have the link for um, if you don't already. But we'll show the link during the webinar and we'll also send it out in an email to today's attendees. So thank you everybody for um, participating today. So what we're going to cover is, you know, we just did the welcomes and introductions. We're going to talk very briefly around this series. Um, we're going to talk about the what is caregiver involvement and the importance of involving caregivers and engaging them in services. And he really kind of think through what challenges uh, we have around involving caregivers. And that's where also where we'd like to hear from you. What challenges have you experienced as well? Um, we're going to talk about working with families successfully and really moving to building understanding of the role that caregivers have and how we can collaborate with them. And then we're going to talk a little bit about strategies for next steps in attending this uh, webinar series and with hopefully a, a little bit of a Q&A at the end. We wanted just to highlight two key points in terms of what the purpose of the series is. And it really is to provide you with information, strategies, and resources to build competencies and family engagement for both supervisors and providers. To provide supervisors also, there's a separate set of webinars specifically for your clinical supervisors with information support 
um, development of a plan of implementation to guide you as you start utilizing some of these best practices. This is a quick summary of the series. Um, so you may have seen that in the announcements or in the uh, sort of the, the promotional materials that have gone out. We already completed webinar one that was specifically for the clinical supervisors. Um, this is the webpage, the mcsilver.org um, uh, is the webpage resource. We will be emailing that out to folks, and Brianna also sent that in the chat box. So you could probably click on that as well so you have that open to you. Uh, today's webinar is family engagement practices. We'll have a part two also focusing on family engagement practices, and these two webinars are really specific to providers and those uh, doing direct services with families. And then we're going to have a final wrap-up webinar with the supervisors again and just really thinking through how clinical supervisors can support their staff in implementing some of these best practices and really sustaining them for the long term. So when we think about engaging families, we have some key core uh, points. This is essentially sort of our viewpoint. This is, this is sort of where we, we start when we start talking about engaging families, and that engagement is about motivating and empowering families to recognize their own needs, strengths, and resources, and to take an active role in changing their lives, especially their families' lives, their children's lives. That really engagement is essential in this provider-family relationship from the moment a family is considered for treatment until they terminate or are discharged. So a common misconception that engagement is only something you think about in the beginning um, but it really is something you think about at every single contact, whether in person or not, with a family, um, all the way through through the end of services. So this is kind of our, our approach um, that really kind of grounds us in, in some of the concepts we're going to present to you today. The other uh, sort of goal in, in this provider-family relationship is that we also feel that it's important that if we develop strong partnerships with families, that that means that families will have greater participation in treatment, and it ideally means that you're going to see more positive outcomes, both not just for the family, but for the child as well. So that these strong partnerships are particularly um, in, important in, in moving us forward. And I think the, the literature, which we're going to talk about briefly, um, really kind of highlights um, uh, what that means and, and, and that this is something that we should consider um, integrating in a more meaningful way as much as possible. Great. Thanks, Lydia. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the key to, uh, around caregiver involvement. That it's really the participation of the caregiver in treatment services addressing the needs of the family and the child. And this is not only in the session, but it's also outside of the session. So it's this act of participation. I mean, sometimes we over-function with caregivers and sometimes we under-function. Under so caregiver involvement is about the balance and really the inclusivity of the caregiver in every step of the engagement process and how important that is. So what do we know about caregiver involvement? Well, first of all, we know that parenting matters, that kids uh, and families that we work with have a, a variety of things going on in their lives and sometimes very chaotic lives. And that parenting really matters. That parents are really the protective factor around the child. And any work, in my opinion, you, that you're going to do with a child really should involve the caregiver. Caregivers are consistently in research uh, connected to positive outcomes when, when uh, a part of the treatment process. And almost half of evidence-based treatments for youth include caregivers in their sessions. So caregivers, what we know about caregivers is they're really a vital part of the treatment process. And I just want to take a minute to talk about attrition because, you know, we do this work in a, in a variety of organizations, as I mentioned earlier. We do this work throughout New York State. We've done this work in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And time and time and time again, we hear about attrition and that, you know, people come for the first few sessions and they don't come back. And it's alarmingly high, right? So that the no-show and attention, uh, attrition rates can be uh, uh, up to 60%. That's really high. And it's mostly the highest for those that are most vulnerable and that really do need and could benefit from services the most. Um, attrition and low treatment dosage increase the likelihood of poor outcomes. So we do know that if people aren't participating in services, that they're not really going to reach those goals that Lydia mentioned around positive outcomes and really improving uh, their mental health and family functioning. What we know about caregiver involvement, 
is that studies show that caregivers are often involved in sessions, but only marginally. So when I first started out doing this work, I, I thought that I worked with caregivers a lot. I would say, hi, how are you doing, mom? How are things going? Or how are you doing, grandma? How are things going? And for me, that was me working with, with a caregiver um, and checking in every now and then, like, how's it going in school? How are things going? And so that the caregivers are really brought into the treatment process kind of on the side, but it's really about the depth that's most important. I think Lydia wanted to say a few things. Yeah, and I think the, the you know, part of our work in, in trying to figure out how to um, uh, communicate some of these messages of engagement was also both in our own professional experience and providing direct services, and all three of us have provided direct services for quite some time, as well as in our role of, of providing training and, and support and supervision, is, you know, what what is, you know, we each have our own experiences around engagement and experiences with caregivers, but what does the literature say? And so uh, 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 what have other folks studied? Um, you know, does it, does it support sort of the challenges that I think some of us experience? So we found some interesting things that we just wanted to highlight in these next couple slides. And in particular, you know, there was this, this one study that really videotaped sessions, something like um, about like a thousand, uh, um, uh, something like a thousand sessions or actually quite a, a few more, something like a hundred providers, um, uh, a couple hundred kids that were being served. So there was all these sessions that were videotaped and they brought in independent observers um, to really kind of um, uh, mark and, and, and go through and see how is it that caregivers are involved in services. And I think what was interesting about this is that vast majority had caregiver involvement in some way. And this is what you see here, that most of them were involved, whether it was something like the period of information gathering, like in the beginning assessment or evaluation, or if there was another need to gather information some way. They were definitely involved when uh, psychoeducation was being provided. They were definitely involved when there's goal setting and, and or reviewing of goals or treatment planning time. Um, and then there was also uh, another period that they were involved, which was really when you were thinking about connecting them with other services, like maybe connecting the child with a referral or of some sort. Um, but what was really highlighted that despite the fact that the vast majority were included across um, the session, that there wasn't a lot of depth to it, right? The idea is that they're, they're utilized in terms of breadth, but not in depth, not in the active parts of treatment. Um, which is really interesting. And I think if we go to the next slide, it also highlights, I'll go to the second point first, is that when therapists reported having pursued a particular strategy or goal, they tended to report having pursued it with much greater intensity than identified by observational coders. And that was actually a separate study um, uh, done, again, with videotape sessions. And it was looking at provider versus caregiver perception versus independent observation of what actually occurred in some of the sessions with families. And the therapists oftentimes thought that they were they they did more, they, that they completed a particular strategy or goal than what independent observers perceived. Um, and I think a flip side of that is also that it, it was also unclear whether caregivers would have agreed that the therapist had met the goal for that session as well. So I think that piggybacks on the concept of breath but not death necessarily. I think it's also important to point out the first piece when um, looking at caregiver perceptions that some of the literature also really quickly points out that the main reason for um, dropout or attrition, some of those rates that Kara was talking about, when caregivers are asked directly, what we find is that it really points to um, therapeutic relationship problems. Um, where caregivers were reporting that they didn't feel that they had an alignment with the provider, that they weren't in agreement around the purpose of treatment and that communication wasn't really being provided directly. Now that study also highlighted that there were other reasons for dropout, that, but that um, foremost, the, the most common and the one that really was connected with dropout was therapeutic relationship problems. So I think here it just highlights the differences between sort of caregiver perceptions of interactions um, and provider. Great, and how important this aligning process is. You know, sometimes we also refer to it as joining and collaborating as well. So I want to chat with you for a little bit. I want to understand from those of you participating with us today what your engagement process looks like in your program. And so just as a reminder, there's a chat, a chat box to the right where you can write in a chat and send to us. You can uh, send to all panelists, or our, and that way we see it right away. So what does engagement look like in your program? 
So specifically, if you, I would love to hear what it looks like, but specifically, do you have a sense of your no-show rate? What are some of the practices that you use? What does involvement look like? So if you could chat in with me, uh, with myself, Lydia, and Jerry, we'd love to hear from you. Is there a standard of protocol that you use? Do you have any changes that you'd like to make to the practices? You can use that chat box on the right uh, hand side on the bottom. If you don't see that box again, you can make sure you click that chat bubble at the top. Um, that, that'll open up the box for you if you don't have it. Okay, thanks, Rachel. We have a, uh, Rachel responds that she has a, a high a history of high low show rates in your high clinic. Low. So there 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 are some attrition issues. It sounds like. We have just initiated a more intentional engagement change plan amongst our agency. Oh, I'd love to hear a little more about that. Yeah, can you let us know what that is? What does that look like? Intentional engagement change plan. Um, so it sounds like it's a more of a purposeful plan, a standardized mm -hmm. plan of sorts. It'd be great if you could chat in what you think, um, what some of those components are. Uh, we'd also make sure we like to hear from others. You know, the, the, the big piece of, um, helping to think through if we need to even consider whether our engagement practices are working or not, or whether we need to try something different, is trying to understand what is our baseline, where are we now in this process. And Lisa responds that she works at a psych residential treatment facility and family engagement is low. Families are often hours away from the location mm -hmm. and scheduling can be difficult. Some of our therapy practices include TFCBT, however, with even with that, a child has a family, we try our best to keep them included in that model since it does have a caregiver component. So you're, you're utilizing practices that involve the caregiver, but uh, getting the caregiver to participate seems to be a challenge, Lisa. Thank you for sharing. So, uh -huh. so we have others also say that it seems like um, if we're able to accommodate family schedules, we have higher show rates. So, so that's an important kind of strategy. Um, Often occurring in the home. Yeah, so, and also being able to have appointments in the home as opposed to the office is probably an important strategy as well. Um, Rachel also clarified and said that they were looking at the research and try to incorporate some of those strategies and try sm small pilot testing. So actually, I think, Rachel, you have a really good model for trying something out, um, seeing if it works and continuing to enhance on it that others could probably utilize as well. Phone calls, letters, um, uh, contracts with families around engagement um, is another way. But, the, uh, but uh, on the flip side, there was also flexible schedules, uh, being mindful of families' time. Skype. We have the ability to use Skype to enhance engagement. Have used this well. That's interesting. Um, we are seeing a lot more technology being utilized. Um, and I'm wondering for those folks who said that the families are far away, that it takes them a long time, are you utilizing um, Skype? I'm not sure if that was the same program or not, or other technologies to engage families. Wonderful. Thank you so much for participating, everyone. This is really great to hear. So, so there's a, a variation in the uh, the types of practices that practices that you're using, and also the challenges that you're having. Um, so it sounds like a lot of you have been most successful when you really go to families in the home or in the community, and that's really important to hear. I think that's a, that's a really important reminder that often it's a challenge just kind of coming to the organization or the clinic, and the more that we can go to to our caregivers and our families. The, the better off you are. And, and some of you also have highlighted that you're using specific treatment models. Um, some uh, have a focus on engaging uh, parents, some maybe not as much of a focus. I think, and I'm, I'm looking at Derry, I think what we would do is really encourage folks to think through how best can we engage the caregiver even if they're not necessarily a part of the original treatment model, um, but that knowing though it is important to kind of think through that process and then we also know that in terms of sustainability of improvement, even if we work individually with a child, um, it, it's the family context that really helps to support uh, and sustain improvement. So how can we incorporate them in that process to ensure that what's happening in the office translates to the home environment? And many of you are already kind of talking about how to, how to look at that and do that, and maybe even doing some of this work in the home. Great, thank you so much. I think we're, we're gonna do a, a brief poll question uh, and this is going to pop up in where the chat box was. How often do you work with caregivers in treatment? 
If you could please check A, every time I have a child client, B, some of the time, C, occasionally, or D, not at all. So check one of those boxes that describes how often you work with caregivers in treatment. A, B, C, or D. And we'll just give a second uh, and stop the poll and then the results will, will pop up as well. We want to get a sense of how often you're working with caregivers in treatment. It sounds like a lot of you are, are really working with caregivers in a variety of ways, but is it some of the time, occasionally, or is it every time? We, we'd like to get a sense of that. Okay, it's going to pop up here in a second. Okay, wonderful. It seems like most of you are really working with caregivers every time you have a child client. That's wonderful to hear. And a, a few of you were not able to answer, but thank you to those who did. That's wonderful to hear. And those of you that do, uh, so we talked a little bit about how you do this. Um, if you would like to chat in more around around ways that you specifically work with caregivers, that would we, I'd love to hear that. Um, also, how do you align with the goals of your client and the family? Please use the chat box so that we can hear, get a sense of what this really looks like for you. So there's, a, 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 you know, we have a couple comments coming in. One is, you know, some uh, really sort of get, um, the, the gist I think of the comment is really um, that sometimes providers assume that caregivers understand what's happening in, in treatment and in services, um, but that oftentimes that, that may not be communicated and that, that is also challenging. So taking the time to have that conversation, provide that psychoeducation, um, helping to kind of work with families in that way seems to be helpful in, in, in developing alignment. And I think what you're also touching upon is the anxiety mm -hmm. often that caregivers feel. And Jerry's, Jerry talks a lot about, you know, caregivers really do want to be involved. Often they don't know how. And so they come to the sessions with a bunch of anxiety. I don't know why my child is in treatment. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm here. How can you help me? And that maybe they're thinking, can you really help us? So there's a, there are a bunch of, uh, I think, emotions that are going on for caregivers that w that's important to tune into as well. Yeah, and others have said really kind of having discussions around barriers and and encouraging have you know setting realistic expectations and encouraging communication around barriers is an important role that we're also going to focus on a little bit um, in, in the next few slides. And we just got another chat that sometimes you try to have parents meet with teachers in the school uh, to increase the dialogue occurring between them. Mm -hmm. Uh, working with parents at home via calls, school meetings. We uh, here we work a lot with parent caregivers via text. Um, so it sounds like you're doing a lot of great work, Susan. Thank you. Parenting sessions is something that Casey reports. Monthly child and family team meetings, check in, check out before and after sessions, asking for updates, areas of focus on the sessions. And so I just want to also make sure that families are a part of the treatment planning as well. This is wonderful. Thank you. I, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry right now. She's going to talk about the challenges of involving caregivers. Okay, so um, challenges of involving caregivers. So we have a chat question for you. What challenges have you experienced in involving caregivers in services, those of you who have uh, done that? Um, and again, same format, uh, just chat in with us and let us know what it is that you've done. Working with groups. Okay, of working with a group of families. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, uh -huh. it's, it's not, not me. me. It's my child. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Have you heard that before, Jerry? I have. Uh -huh. I definitely have. What do you think about when you hear that? Well, listen. <laughs> a lot of things could be going on uh, when when it, when that's being said, and I think it's just important to um, meet that family that caregiver where they are and, you know, kind of have a dialogue with them um, about what's going on to get to the heart of, of things and just being um, as transparent as you can and helping them to understand what the process is. Mm -hmm. Fix my child, I don't need the service they do. I've heard that before as well, definitely. 
Distance has been a challenge if the child is placed in a residential treatment facility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a huge one. That is huge. Um, In my specific model, the challenges are their past experiences of having systems in and out of their lives. They have a hard time trusting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Those past experiences can be very challenging. And really, and I think it's important to notice that all these challenges are important to uh, attend to them. Right. And here's one, um, don't tell me how to parent. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it. That can be very okay. challenging. Um, parents are burned out from mental health services if they have been through multiple systems and placements. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's an interesting comment because I think that's also the flip side of the fix my child. So exactly. You, sometimes we we've, we've worked with parents who have been through this so many times and it hasn't worked out well, right? There wasn't maybe good alignment. Mm-hmm. It didn't meet their expectations. So you sometimes are just exhausted and get to the point, you know, yeah. how how can you really help me to to, to work with this child? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And nine times out of ten, by the time um, most uh, families get to the therapist, they have been through so much. You know, schools have been calling and um, parents have uh, been on the verge of maybe losing their job, have already lost their job, or they have maybe uh, two children that have uh, issues. So, I mean, there's a lot that's going on. Oh, this is interesting. Conflicting parenting styles with shared parenting. Mm -hmm. So true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That can be a very big challenge. That can be a huge challenge. Absolutely. That's something that we work on with parents in the model that we have here around getting people on the same page. So it's really, that's that's important to think about. Definitely. Language barriers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes language barriers. Staff who don't speak strong Spanish, for example. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then what happens sometimes in sessions, from what I've heard, is that uh, the child ends up doing the translation, and that's not good at all. Mm-hmm. No, definitely not. So uh, thank you to everyone who uh, chatted in. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Definitely wonderful. great stuff. And so this leads into barriers. Absolutely. So as we know, there are many barriers to engagement, and um it's important that those are definitely addressed. Um, um, just imagine if one of these barriers or a few of them are happening at the same time, and um, how can a, a, a parent or caregiver be uh, ready for treatment? I mean, um, one of the main ones, like practical uh, barrier, could be time constraints, um, child care transportation, competing priorities, getting the child there. Um, and there are perceptional barriers, there's mental health issues and uh, family ecology, um, that, that caregiver may be dealing with their own mental health issues, uh, multiple stressors, isolation, trauma, uh, there could be substance abuse, and there could be family and marital conflict. And, um, and all of these are very important, cultural, uh, diverse caregiver values, helping um, speaking traditions, um, beliefs, language, as we said earlier, life experience, cultural uh, relevance of a program, the agency, the perception of the worker. And for immigrants, this is huge, their trust of authority or have, or they may have their own authority structures. Um, and for my minority group families, racial discrimination, community, social stigma, shame, doubt about provider cultural competence. All of these are, are huge. And then there's uh, systematic barriers, and some of them could be poor service coordination, um, that there could be gaps, there could be wait list issues, which happens all the time. Program site and hours. Sometimes, um, if there's a fa- family who uh, is working full time and they don't have after hour or Saturday uh, hours, it, it can present problems. And then there's agency worker resources and responses. And I think this also this perceived coerciveness that sometimes happens in families where. Caregivers are often afraid that their child may be taken away yes. or, or fear of confidentiality concerns. I, I've, I've experienced that as a big barrier as well. Right, right. And then there's sometimes when um, teachers are uh, pushing parents to uh, have their children um, um, evaluated and um, put on medication and they make little comments because I experienced that with my own son. You know, um, I came into the school one day for a meeting and the gym teacher um, made a snide remark about, um, oh, um, 
uh, some the secretary had asked me to buy some candy, and um, the gym teacher mentioned, oh, well, I wouldn't sell her any candy because, you know, she gave it to her son, and he's hyper enough as it is. Mm-hmm. And I was just done. Mm-hmm. I, I just looked at him. I, I didn't say anything, and this is when my son was very young. Mm-hmm. But, again, these are things that parents have to deal with, and, and that's not good at all. So um, Can you all agree with all these barriers? <laughs> just chat in yes if you can. Yeah, that Do these resonate good. with you? So, um, what does uh, here's some research findings on barriers to uh, engagement. Great, thanks. Um, not all barriers are equal. Um, um, perceptual barriers, for example, stigma and prior negative experiences, have been shown to have the greatest influence on initial and ongoing engagement. And then addressing those perceptual barriers may be more important than focusing only on mm-hmm. concrete mm-hmm. obstacles. And in order to have a positive collaborative partnership in the treatment process with families, you have to sometimes address, well, most of the time, you need to address these barriers in order to move forward in that process. Very so those, So all those barriers, so thank you for chatting in, yes, it sounds like you could yeah. all relate to them. And I think of all those barriers, what we're saying is, which Jerry's just said, is that those perceptual barriers are often the most important to attend, attend to. Right. So with, uh, if you've had negative experiences, if you've been in, in, in a variety of, of treatment services before that may not have worked out well, that attending to those and attending to those perceptual barriers are really the most important. So some of you, uh, one person said that some of those barriers you could relate to. I'd be interested if you, if you want to expand on that, uh, right. what, what you couldn't relate to or if there's something that we missed. So I also just wanted to add that perceptual barriers are oftentimes the ones that don't get talked about. And I think we had some comments that came in about, like, talking about the elephant in the room. So it's easier for sometimes for me to say that I, I, I'm, I had uh, transportation issues, so that's why I wasn't able to come, um, than for me to say, you know what, I just don't think you're a good fit, I don't, or I don't think you're a good provider, mm-hmm. or I think – um, I'm feeling, I, I feel like I'm being judged mm-hmm, or, right. you know what, I don't know about this whole mental health services thing. You know, people think I'm, I'm crazy. I don't want people finding out. Right. Those are oftentimes conversations that don't come up unless we as the provider really initiates them and creates a safe and comfortable environment for people to share that level of information. Otherwise, we're always going to stay at that concrete level around transportation or other child care issues, not to minimize those. Those are very real and oftentimes do get in the way, but that perceptual barriers are oftentimes really the foremost issue, but then the ones that are most dif- conversations most difficult to have and then they don't really occur. Um, so it's a really kind of thinking through how can I approach these conversations, how can I create a safe environment in which to get feedback, in which to talk about some of these things is really vital. And both Karen and Jerry have spent some time really talking about that, and we hope to be able to show you some examples in, in the webinar as well. And stigma is huge, right, yes, Jerry? I mean, Absolutely. we see that in, in so many different ways, yes. just the feelings yes, yes. of stigma and shame. And, right. and the best way to counteract that is to be non-judgmental. Absolutely. And and practice that over and over again. And talking about that, I think, is really helpful. But yeah. that, no, it, it really is. I mean, and, and you can get it from all levels. You can get it from your own family members. You can get it from wherever friends. Um, mm-hmm. if, if you attend a church, um, you know, people will shun you. Um, so there's many, many places where you can um, get it. And I think some of the worst is, like, when you're out and about in your community, and if your child happens to act out or whatever and, you know, people are really, really giving you those dirty looks or they may say, oh, well, all you need to do is just give them a swift, swift kick in the butt or, you mm-hmm. know, beat him or, or her or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, you know, and, and when that when those things happen, it isolates you. It, it really makes you feel that you are less than um, a person. Um, so. It's, it's huge. It really is. So we have some wonderful comments coming Absolutely. in that really also highlight that it really comes down to building a trusting relationship with the mm-hmm. caregiver and with the family. And even though it's hard, it's important to kind of set that tone in that stage and to reduce judgment. Um, and I think that seems to be a theme of a number of the comments that have just come in, um, that although difficult, vital conversation to have. So we really appreciate some of that feedback. Um, we also wanted to talk a little bit more about caregiver perception. So, like, we, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, that perceptions are, are um, uh, really kind of get in the way 
um, oftentimes are more powerful barriers um, than concrete ones. So we kind of looked at the literature, we looked at some of uh, what's been done around what are caregivers' perceptions, and this is some, some examples from some uh, study that was done. But I think, I think uh, if I can speak for the three of us here, mm -hmm. I think these resonate um, uh, pretty directly with our own experiences. So for example, clinicians don't really care uh, what you got to say, all they care about is what they got to tell you. Um, you know, I'm really totally uncomfortable because every time I say anything, I get blamed and I'm tired of getting blamed. Um, that it's very hard when professionals don't listen or understand. And I think the, the message or the theme really is here is that oftentimes if I as a caregiver, and I think the three of us here are also parents, right? Right. And so as a parent, if I go to a provider and I'm feeling, I get this vibe that I'm, I'm feeling blamed, that there's judgment being passed on me, um, I combine that with maybe low expectations because at the same time is that we're assessing families, families are assessing us. So that evaluation period, those intake sessions go both ways, right? So if I as a caregiver feel like I'm not, you know, that there's some judgment being passed on me, if I as a caregiver also have just low expectations, I don't think this is going to work, maybe I had past, bad past experiences, maybe I don't feel we're communicating or connecting well, um, and, and and add to that, especially as time goes on, if I don't see positive outcomes, oftentimes what you see there is uh, what we consider to be resistant. So the idea being that um, uh, uh, per, that oftentimes what the language that us as providers use as resistance really turns around, um, I, I, it really kind of just highlights what is behind that resistance. Why are we using that language oftentimes, which really sometimes gets in the way of the work that we're doing with families, but also what does that mean? What is it that I'm seeing? Am I seeing, um, you know, somebody who feels judged? Am I seeing somebody who feels low expectations? Well, you know, I as a caregiver may also have those same feelings as why I was in those shoes. So that's right. also something to consider. Right. I mean, and some I mean, I've heard also caregivers say, you know, um, when they go having to repeatedly tell their story over and over again, and sometimes it's almost like they're being re-traumatized, and some some sometimes, not all the time. And then um, a lot of them, some of them, had also said that uh, they feel that the clinicians are more concerned about their paperwork than actually focusing on um, their needs. So um, these are just some of the things that uh, caregivers feel. So I want to talk a little bit about how practitioners may feel. So Jerry and Lydia just talked a lot about how caregivers may feel. How do practitioners feel? And I have to let you know, I was a practitioner for many years and I still do uh, some direct service work and, and this was, and this is something that I can relate to, so feeling reluctant and anxious. So I started my work in a residential treatment center working with caregivers uh, and their children, uh, but we, you know, like the person talking about the residential, residential treatment facility, I completely relate to that. Getting caregivers to come to us was really difficult. So you know what, I went to them. I decided to go to them and most of my time was spent out in the community with the caregivers and their children. But I was really nervous about it and I was really reluctant to do it. And I can't say that the culture of the, of the organization I was working for was very supportive. A lot of my coworkers were sitting in the office so, you know, having some reluctance, having some anxiety, uncertain of, you know, what's the caregiver's role in all this and if there's, uh, and you know, if, if this has been ongoing for many years, how do I work with that? You know, concern that the caregiver may be, may be to blame for the child's difficulties. I heard that, that somebody commented on that. I saw around, you know, the teacher blaming the caregiver and the, uh, the caregiver blaming the teacher and this kind of cycle of blaming. Having some lack of confidence and knowledge, you know, I can completely relate to that when I first started, like being really scared and nervous about my ability to really help these families that I was working with. And then having some ambivalence, you know, concerned about, uh, you know, I didn't want to make anyone mad. I didn't want to side with the child. I didn't want to side with the caregiver. I wanted to be able to help them both. And so having some real ambivalence around that. Also feeling a little avoidant, you know, sometimes caregivers that we work with do have their own needs and aren't aren't able or, or want to or can get, get their needs met and so concerned about the caregiver's mental health and how they're doing. Um, so all the work that we do is collaborative with, collaborative with caregivers for one of those reasons, to really open that door if caregivers have various needs, we can help them get those met. Feeling scared, you know, concerned about how, how's the caregiver going to respond to me? Are they going to hate me? Are they, what, how are they going to respond to me? 
Um, and then compassion fatigue, just feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by the work. I'm curious about you all. Do you feel these, uh, can you relate to these um, practitioner barriers is what we're calling them? And then are there any others that we missed? What else gets in the way of, of you know, actively pursuing and engaging caregivers? If you just want to chat in with us, we'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. oh. So it looks like it's meeting the family where they are, but that also means maybe meeting them in the home. So it sounds like many of you will do home and community-based services, but um, for, for those that aren't doing them, maybe that's something to consider. Um, really focusing on, on uh, um, sometimes being personally triggered by some of the comments mm -hmm. and, and, and the things that are coming in. I think that's really powerful. I think, you know, we, we sometimes take, uh, our, you know, we sometimes talk in some of these trainings about how the, the work that we do is really unique in the sense that the tools are ourselves. It's our empathy. It's our relational skills. It's our communication skills. But that also can get messy sometimes, and that sometimes it, it means that um, our, our emotions sometimes can get in the way. Um, and, and that's an important point to make that I think is very common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that, and that really just um, do, having negative views and, and passing judgment also get, kind of gets in the way, even before really meeting them or trying to understand where they're coming from. So thank you, everybody, for that feedback. Um, uh, I think that's really helpful. And then some other barriers to think that may um, to really consistently assure ensure the alignment. The one thing that wasn't mentioned, which is good, I think, is this time constraint, right? But I'm sure you all feel it. This the product productivity demands and having having a variety of demands that really uh, take away your time and sometimes take away your energy and time that really where it should be uh, directed towards the family and the child not used to working in certain ways can be a barrier. Um, perspectives of the family may be skewed or negative and uh, where we also um, talk about, you know, we have certain assumptions about the family that they, they know that already or what have you. Anything else that's coming up? Well, I mean, somebody Here. sort of that mentioned sort of that the, 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 that experience of resistance, um, you know, that there, that some, that really is a barrier or the, um, the feeling that the parent isn't really making an effort, so so you kind of get trapped in this cycle about who's putting more effort and, and is it worthwhile or not. Um, and, and I think what we'd like to encourage everybody is to kind of break away from that concept, even stop using the word, um, and kind of really try and think through what is it. Let's, let's reframe some of that um, conversation, some of those behaviors, some of those actions to really try to understand what is it that I'm seeing um, is there a conversation to be had here? Um, yeah. I really encourage I really encourage people to think about the word resistance and and replacing it with the word fear. Right. And so often it's it's not really about resistance; it's about fear and a variety of fears, right? And so I think that fear of my will my child be taken away? Can somebody help me? Do I deserve to be helped? Is sometimes uh, some of those those beliefs that are under there. And so that that's really what resistance looks like. Or if I, mm -hmm. it, you know, if I've had, if I've gotten to the point where I need to seek services, then, you know, what good am I as a parent? Maybe I don't have enough tools or skills. They're better off right. without me. I exactly. mean, there's lots of things going on. It's very complicated. And I think many of you probably have these experiences, but those feelings really don't come into light unless those conversations are had. And I think the main message that we're giving, I think many of you were getting so much feedback. So thank you everybody for participating. Um, is that we want to move from a cycle of resistance where we're, we are also on some level re providing resistance at the same time. So um, uh, caregivers see our resistance. Um, we think caregivers are resistant sometimes, and then we're essentially stuck in this relational process where we're in the cycle of, of resistance. We want to move is, is to the cycle of collaboration and rethink that a little bit and maybe use Kara's concept of fear um, and, and I would even add fear on the both sides, yeah, right? Yeah. right. Um, and yeah, really thinking absolutely. through how can we come together mm -hmm. um, and, and collaborate? How can we become a we uh, moving forward? And, and, and I think that's um, uh, a challenge sometimes, but I think definitely doable. So we want to move on to working with families successfully, really thinking through how can we then build uh, understanding? What are some things that we know work? 
So um, there's caregiver uh, resilience and um, persistence in the face of adversity, uh, ecology as a fact of life rather than a barrier. And here are some um, things that caregivers tell us. It's just too much. It's just too much. Um, feeling overwhelmed again. If I ever, if I was ever going to be able to fit the program into what we were already grappling with. Then their caregivers, they show incredible strength and resiliency doing what they need to get help for their kids. Caregivers tell us, I'll do whatever it takes. My kids need help, and I'm not going to stop until he gets it. And then caregivers may have repeatedly experienced disappointment and a sense of loss, a history of 10,000 defeats. And those things are real. You know, people may think that, you know, they're just being resistant. Um, again, there's that word. Um, or just uh, being negative about the whole situation, but these things are extremely real. Um, and the key message is that uh, parents will overcome challenges to help their, ch their child and strengthen their family, and they do this on a daily basis. Our role is to understand where they're coming from and to support them in this process. All righty. So I just wanted to, um, I, I, I would like to encourage you to use the chat box um, and then just think through some of these examples. Many of you have utilized these, uh, have already mentioned some of these, like um, these experiences that, you know, these conversations you have with families, or maybe they're multi-stressed or overwhelmed, or they've had a bad experience, or maybe there's another relative that disapproves of seeking care, so that's a challenge, um, or that the, the family, the caregiver that may say, that really fix my kid, right? So can you just use that chat box um, as we continue to move on with the presentation and let us know, you know, what would make it hard for these folks to see services? Uh, what do they to, um, access services and, and to utilize services? What might they like to hear? How can we actually invite them to participate? So thinking about them a little bit differently and how would we invite them? What messages do we want to give them? How can we encourage them to participate? So if you can use that chat box and, and just give us some suggestions. How can you look at some of these families a little bit differently and work with them knowing some of the things that we just talked about today? Um, so feel free to keep submitting those. Thank you for everybody for, for participating. We're gonna highlight some as they come up. I think that the, the idea is that the desired outcome of early interactions is that the caregiver develops motivation by experiencing a sense of support for their current emotions and concerns, a sense of hope, uh, that prompts can change and belief that the work and treatment can help promote the desired changes. And I think the challenge there is really instilling hope, right? So the parent that's exhausted really needs a lot of hope. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the parent um, that, that feels like they don't have anywhere else to turn needs to feel really supported. They also have their own felt needs, you know, and engaging the conversation, what is it that you think you need? Mm -hmm. um, right. Some of you are already writing in, validating their experiences and feelings, yeah. and that is key. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So every interaction with a caregiver involves validation and instilling hope at every step. It really goes a long way. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to point out that there's someone on the line who's really doing a wonderful job. Dishia says that she puts a lot of energy into providing support and building good rapport from the very beginning, and you've actually had a lot of good outcomes doing so. So that's exactly what this point is right here. So thank you. I think sometimes that the processes for parents, I know this is a little bit of a funny thought. <laughs> you know, the, so when parents kind of walk into services, they, they, many of them may not know what to expect, or they have previous kind of negative experiences that are clouding their experience with you. Um, so it's confusing. So I can't read this. I'm not even sure yeah, where this is from, right? <laughs> but the idea being is that it is a confusing process, and anything mm -hmm. we can do to orient people, to explain, it. to clarify, to provide that yeah. important psychoeducation will really go a long way in addition to instilling hope and validating folks. One key message um, I think is, is something for all of you to consider as you take some of this content and, and, and utilize it after the webinar or you work with your supervisors is, how, what is the most critical message to communicate to caregivers, right? And, and, and what we want you to think about 
is what do you want them to say about you when they leave your clinic or your program? How do they experience the services? Right. How do they experience the services? What are they going to tell their friends and family exactly. after they have left? That's huge. And then, and then maybe start there. What is it that we want people to say about our services? And now how do we work backwards to ensure that the interaction yeah. leads to that? Yeah. Um, so what are those critical messages? And then that those messages need to be shared day one and all the way through. So I just want to point out that Lisa shared that they have an acronym they're trying to implement called RICH, which stands for Respectful, Giving Information, Connection, and Instilling Hope. Oh, that's Great. wonderful, Lisa. That. Listening to their experiences and being with them is a, is, is a really important part of that process. And I think that's a really good, succinct way of, mm -hmm. of highlighting Thanks some of those things. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I think what we want to highlight, and we're going to spend more time on this in our second webinar, is the, the role of, of collaboration. That what we want to do is collaborate with families on a shared vision and mission on power, sharing power. So oftentimes there's a disconnect where the provider has the authority and the power and the family doesn't. But if we can share power, we can share knowledge, we can share experiences, we can share goals, what that's going to lead to is really respect, empathy, Choice communication is going to really contribute to a more positive experience kind of moving forward. It, the idea is that it creates that trust that we've all spent some time talking about. So we could, we wanted to give an example of um, really kind of, of an interaction because we sometimes feel that these webinars, um, you know, the, the, the conversation is really helpful, but sometimes hearing an example. So Tara and Jerry are going to participate in a brief role play. Um, the concept is that Jerry and her son Jason, who is not here, um, are, are attending their third session. So it's really Jerry attending the third session in the clinic to find that she, her, the therapist changed without telling her. So she just shows up and she knows that there's a new therapist. Okay. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for coming in today. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, uh, I guess I'm okay. I don't know. I'm I'm a little taken back. Um, what happened to Miss Yvette, who I spoke, who Jason and I uh, met previously? Yeah. So my so let me just back up for a second and introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me and apologize. So I you know you I think I mentioned over the phone or the secretary mentioned to you that you were going to have a new therapist. I don't know if you got that message. Mm, I don't recall that. You didn't. Okay. No. Well, my name is Kara, and I'm going to be your new therapist. And I've had a lot of experience working with families and kids over the years, and I'm really excited to work with you and Jason. And I know you've been here for a few a few weeks now, and you were seeing Miss Yvette, and I'm really sorry that she's not here anymore. Um, she actually had to go away for personal reasons. Uh, but I'm going to be your new therapist. So how, how do you feel about that? Um... Uh, I I guess I I really don't have a choice in the matter, but um, I was looking forward to uh doing going through this whole treatment process with Missy Vet. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, because she she really understood our family and our needs, and um, I'm just mm -hmm. I'm a little frustrated. You know, um, you said someone uh left a message, but I didn't get that message, mm -hmm. and I'm really concerned about you know how this whole process is going to go forward now. I, I really am. Well, thank you for your honesty. I can imagine. I, I would be really frustrated, too, if I didn't know I was coming to, to get some help from my, my child and, and hear someone new, and I had been connecting with, with someone like Miss Yvette. She is really wonderful. She I really like her as well. Um, so thanks for sharing that, that frustration you're feeling. Um, I do want you to know that we do, Miss Yvette and I, both have a lot of things in common and we may look different so it sounds like you're a little concerned about the fact that we look different is that what yeah, i'm hearing yeah uh yeah -huh. you guys definitely look different uh -huh. um you know and um that's a con that that's a huge concern yeah it and really i appreciate is. that it really is so, so Miss Yvette is, is a black woman and I'm a white woman and you may mm -hmm. think that I'm not going to be able to help you because of that on some level. Is that true? Uh, yeah. 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 Definitely. I really you appreciate know? hearing that. So, um, but one of the biggest things I think Miss Yvette and I have in common is that we really care about families and that we really want to help families like you and Jason. 
And I think that's something we really have in common. But I understand your fear and I understand your, your skepticism. So I'm, I'm hoping we can take this kind of slow. So you're coming in to see me today and then we'll see each other next week if that's okay and just kind of take it slow. What, how does that feel? That feels good. Mm -hmm. And, but again, as they say, you know, the jury's still out on this and you really are going to have to, uh, pardon me saying this, but I'm, I really love sports. You're really going to have to bring your A game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but, um, I thank you for being open and honest with me. I, I really do. Um, so I look forward to working with you. Great. So we'll see each other next week. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so I, I think what we saw there was just one example. We got some feedback while we were doing that to say that this is often an experience that others have, um, especially in settings where the provider changes often or maybe it's different providers each time. I think we've all experienced that ourselves and in the services that we do. So it sounds like it, 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 it's just one example of touching a difficult topic there, which was race, and, and that there wasn't necessarily a, a match on race. There was concerns that the provider wouldn't understand me. And I think that that, that um, I think is, is one example. And I think what we're going to do is spend some more time on that in our next webinar. We wanted to just to highlight a few more things. Um, before we, we 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 end and here this we talked about a lot of these actually yeah. but i think this is also a good summary slide the slides are going to be posted on that web page maybe to print out or, or to post somewhere um or, or or to carry with you as you do home visits but that there are some key things that we know are important in 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 engaging caregivers and involving them in services and and just really summarizing it's you know really it begins with respecting um, that uh, making sure the caregiver feels respected and heard, that we're using our techniques, our tools, like reflective listening and validating their experiences, that we're reframing liberally. Like, for example, here it says change self-blame to regret. Mm -hmm. You know, I think these are really powerful tools to utilize with families that also support engagement. Clarifying those goals and making sure it attends to the caregiver's felt need, um, instilling hope, attending to barriers. So these are all things we've kind of talked about. It's a good summary slide. Um, there's one example from uh, other work that we've done that the provider basically says, you know, I sometimes I ask their permission to let me help them with their problem, right? right? That that attends to a power issue where you're giving the power then to the family um, by asking their permission to even work with them. And oftentimes that is not the typical approach in, in, in many of the services that we all provide. So that's something I think important to, to consider as we move forward. Um, I, I, you know, here again, and Jerry, feel free to, to jump in on some of these. That these are additional summary slides on strategies to engage and empower families, like that positive feedback, reinforcing strength. Right. Jerry spent a lot of time talking about caregiver resilience. How, what can we highlight what, uh, that, that is going well? Um, what, what are some areas that we can do to support and build resilience? Um, and one of the other things um, going down next to the last so that families have concerns about privacy and yeah, confidentiality, important. that's huge. And um, those who do not trust the provider or feel the information shared will not be held in confidence are also at a greater risk for dropout. Um, so very true, especially when families are involved with other uh, systems. Um, very uh, yeah. important. So I think these slides are going to be really helpful for you to just utilize as good summary points. Um, this is just a couple examples on attending to those past experiences that right. we already kind of talked about, but really just taking the time to talk, ask, have you been um, in, in these services before or similar services? What do you expect out of coming here? What do you think will happen? And then taking some time to problem solve and engage them and orient them. Um, giving the opportunity to collect feedback, to contract for future services like you know, like asking, you know, for their permission to work with them. Right. Uh, creating a space for participants to feel comfortable. It's really focusing, even though we're oftentimes rushed, where there's a lot of things we need to do, lots of paperwork, but really kind of thinking through how can we make sure that those first appointments in particular, but all of them, are opportunities to really engage and create that environment where you feel safe and, and, and you feel trusted and you feel respected. I would also say just to check in with them um, and, and find out, you know, for example, how do you feel about the process? Is it working for you? You know, something along those lines as yeah. well. Validation is key, you know, um, really utilizing strength-based comments. Um, so 
um, you can say, you know, you have really set some good house rules, for example, or you can positively reframe, reframe. I think these are good examples. So, like, it is obvious that you yell at your son because you care a great deal about his being successful and happy in school. So it isn't necessarily that you're agreeing with their method, but that you're understanding kind of where they're coming from and sharing that, that understanding and that empathy with the caregiver. So validation, um, another way to think about it are arch principles around acceptance, respect, curiosity, honesty, all different approaches. Or you can use that rich approach that one of your colleagues utilizes as well. Um, we're going to spend, we just wanted to summarize uh, some things that we're going to cover in the next one. Is another way to think about this is this family alignment model that focuses on understanding of treatment, what are clear roles, psychoeducation, collaborative treatment planning, agreement with the child. That there's some key core steps that we know in addition to the way we communicate and relate with families that are important to cover in those first um, 30 days or those first few appointments. Um, that really helps support ongoing participation in services. So we spent some time talking with your supervisors in the last webinar um, around helpful tools and resources and things we can do for next steps. Um, so I highly encourage you to check out the resource page. We're going to email out that link um, uh, by tomorrow um, so everybody has access to the web page directly. Um, there's going to be a number of tools and things you can utilize there. We in particular want to highlight this checklist. There's a family alignment checklist that helps to um, that helps you kind of do a self-assessment of when you're working with families. Have you hit each of these core points? Um, and if you feel you need improvement in some of those areas, we also encourage greatly for supervisors to utilize this checklist with their staff or other maybe other colleagues can also sit in on some of your interactions with families, just so you get that sort of third party observation to see if there are any areas of improvement. And we encourage this as a professional development process, as a process to continue to work on and building our best practices and the quality of our services, um, not necessarily as, as a method to judge, but really a method to support moving forward with the types of services and the quality of services. So it's really that continuous quality improvement process that some of you have already outlined, you've utilized. So we highly recommend kind of really think, attending our next webinar on the 29th. Um, Kara spent some time talking about, do you know what your baseline show rates are? Do you know what your baseline engagement practices are? What are you currently doing now? Um, can you use that checklist I just showed you that you'll be able to download um, and, and kind of think through areas of, of improvement, areas you think you could change or do things a little differently? Um, can you utilize your supervision sessions to rehearse and discuss some of these methods? Um, can you have an observation? Can you have somebody observe your, your, super, your um, session with a family to see if you're utilizing some of those best practices? Um, do you have a process in which to collect feedback from families? How can you remember we said provider and character perceptions are oftentimes not in sync? How can we make sure that we get that caregiver feedback at every contact? And then lastly, really thinking through is there any data that you can utilize to attend to some of this? Um, how can you, are there surveys? Are there other methods that you're already utilizing that can help support implementation of some of these best practices? So um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up. But we want you to think about is one thing you can start doing today that will really help you moving forward um, in trying to implement some of these practices. And we gave a number of recommendations and suggestions. So feel free to pick one of those, to utilize some of those. Um, at minimum, maybe it's just to register for the next webinar on the 29th. Um, that's probably the easiest thing to do. I'm going to ask Lisa who, Lagman from Behavioral Healthcare, who may be on the webinar, to also maybe there's a way we can send a reminder out to folks. Thank you, everybody, for participating. This is our contact information. Please feel free to contact us directly or through Lisa. And we look forward to hearing from everybody again mm -hmm. on um, the 29th. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.